doing the research for this piece, which has been extensive and two years in the running, I kept having one question go through my head, which was, what would Johnson say to Obama if he were here today? It's so hard to know. It's a, it's, it's, these are different times, and it's a different Washington. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, Lyndon Johnson would, would succeed in Washington under any circumstances, but I don't know that he would succeed to the same extent that he did during his time. Uh, Washington has fundamentally changed. What would probably not have changed is, is uh, LBJ's ability to read uh, people he was trying to get something from. Johnson was so fixed on what he was doing in Washington, on exercising power, on, on gaining power, on, on, uh, on using it to uh, achieve his legislative ends. He didn't really have any hobbies, but he did see the importance of the arts and humanities. This is the man who created right. the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. This is the guy who gave, gives us PBS and NPR. This is the guy who exploits Kennedy's death in the first month of his presidency in order to give us the Kennedy Cultural Center in Washington. Mm -hmm. That's remarkable. So he knew, he, he understood the value of the arts and humanities to to Americans. In your experience thinking about presidents and meeting these presidents, um, how have these different presidents thought about power? Are they similar in their thinking about power from someone like Johnson who you've written about to um, Jimmy Carter to George W. Bush to Barack Obama to Bill Clinton? Or do you think they really have quite different visions of political power and how to wield it? That. Um, it's one thing I can tell you is that there's no one who uh, runs for the office of president without thinking about power, without thinking about what they're going to do uh, with the power invested in them by virtue of the office that they they hold or seek to hold. Uh, Johnson, however, was a different creature altogether. There are very few chief executives who um, who were as consumed by power and and who used it with his, uh, the facility that LBJ did. There are a few. There, Washington really understood power effectively. Um, uh, FDR, my gosh, totally understood the way, way power was acquired and exercised. A TR, T Teddy Roosevelt, too. But there aren't many in Johnson's league. No. Often you hear the adjective ruthless associated to Johnson. And, and, and you know, he was powerful and ruthless. And, but the fact is, in those the, many of those conversations that you've heard are with lawmakers, people with whom mm -hmm. Johnson is trying to get something legislatively. And you can see that there's, a, there's a, an ease in those relationships. Johnson's cultivated them. Mm -hmm. Johnson yeah. knows he's going to need them. And he's not foolish enough to be ruthless. Because ruthlessness burns bridges. You know, comity and, and accommodation and, um, uh, you know, reaching out in the manner that Johnson did, that's what creates relationships and allows you to do business with them. Johnson was always willing to give somebody something uh, whenever they ask, if he could do it. Because he realized that what, that, that built up political capital. Mm -hmm. If I give you something, that means I can come back to you and ask something from you. So he was always willing to do as much as he could for other folks. That's the way the world works to a certain degree. Johnson got that. Mm -hmm. He understood that. that. We really draw quite a bit on the historical materials that the library has made available. So I wondered in your kind of role, not only as LBJ scholar and presidential scholar, but as director of the library, to get to see the piece, which it's in turn drew upon the resources of the library and the archive. Um, if, you, if there was anything that struck you about that or what you thought about you know, seeing some of the, those famous photographs and some of the audio recordings turn up in, in this very different setting of a dance theater piece. What was that like as the kind of uh, uh, custodian of the archive here? In the well, I thought you did a great job of mining the right material to show the many nuances of LBJ. Mm -hmm. I think I said this in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. And you get the, so many different sides of him, and I, I really admired that. And the, and the dance complemented the audiovisual pieces that you, you used. It was a really nice nice use of the material that, that we have here. Uh, but, but you know, you use certain conversations, you use certain pictures, you use certain, you know, moving images and speech speeches. You just did a great job of showing him in all his 
many sides. And I was looking at things, and as I was watching the piece, I was thinking, wow, wouldn't it be great if they used such and such conversation, and then it would appear next, and wow, that's amazing. <laughs> you guys are really good. Is there one that we left out? Is it the Martin Luther King um, Johnson conversation about getting them into the pulpits and getting it on the, on the radio? And is it that one? I think that's probably, you know, we all, I, I think it's a, that's a matter of subjectivity. I don't know that you left much out in terms of what you were trying to do, mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is to depict power as exercised right. by one man who was an exemplar mm -hmm. of, of power. Mm -hmm. And I think you did that very effectively with the material you had. Uh, anybody who's listened to the telephone tapes, which are just such a, a treasure in American history, mm -hmm. uh, has a favorite. And my favorite happens to be that conversation between uh, LBJ and Martin Luther King in the beginning of 1965 when they're uh, they're really spurring each other on. You can see what a symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. They both have the same objective. They both want to bring equal rights to all Americans. And in this case, they want to pass the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. uh, but they both have hindrances, and they realize that the other can help them right. to achieve their ends. And you can hear in that conversation how they're doing that. It's just it's magic. 